OK, so before the ORAM detour, uh, I mean, I think that it's, it's interesting. This, we, we are covering this uh, landscape of search, searchable encryption, which is uh, very, very interesting. There is a lot to be discovered. Uh, OK, so I'm sure you remember the, this approach we have about uh, uh, um, resolving this is too much echo uh, resolving uh, uh, conjunctions shall uh, it's at echo um, yeah. So we, we had this approach in which uh, we take every keyword. I mean, we do an uh, inverted index where every keyword has a list of documents it belongs to. And then uh, we take a value called the uh, XIND, which represents you know, some uh, randomized form of a document index. And we check for each one of the X terms, W2 to WN, whether they belong to that uh, int. And we do, do that through a hash function where the inputs are the x int and uh, some PRF mapping of uh, the x term w2 to wn. And we have this hash function that uh, gives us a value. We search in a set. And if the value is there, it means that uh, keyword wj is in, in the, in the, in the document in, and if all w2 to wn are there, then we return uh, that document as uh, satisfying the conjunction. And uh, we call this a basic cross-tag protocol, BXT, and it's nice in the sense that it's very simple, very intuitive, and it uh, uh, improves on the naive uh, conjunction a, a, a protocol where the, con the naive one means just uh, do a single keyword search on W1 to WN and then do the intersection. So this is much more uh, efficient and it has uh, significantly less leakage, but it still has more leakage than we would like. Particularly, there are two types of leakage that I particularly dislike here. One is the fact that you can take any S term from one query with any X term from another query, and the server can check at least the size of the intersection. Uh, that's number one. And another thing that is not nice is that these X int values have to be the same for any repeating document. It has to be the same because the server has to input that into the hash function, which means that actually the uh, server can also find intersections, or at least sizes of intersections between S terms. So overall, there is a lot of cross-query uh, leakage happening here, less than in the naive, but still not very nice. So now the next step is to try to avoid this um, cross, cross leakage. Let me skip this part. Uh, so, okay, so the idea is, first of all, the, the simplest of the ideas is that the problem we had with the BXT is that the, the client was sending all these extraps, extrap 2 to extrap n, representing w2 to wn, to the server, and the server did the computation of the hash function, so it knew all these values, and then it can use it with an S term from any other query. So what we want to do is that the, the client will not disclose these extraps. And the very simple way of doing that, the, the server will discover the exit values from the list, you know, the W1 list, and will send the scenes to the client who will compute himself the hash function. And will send the value back to the, to, to, to the server. In that way, the server doesn't learn uh, the uh, extracts for W2 to WN, and it cannot do this cross-query uh, cross, um, leakage. 
And actually, that's, that's a good uh, solution, except that, well, first of all, it requires the more round, one more round of interaction with the client. Um, and also, now the server can cheat by sending scenes from a different search. So it's now, it's, I mean, if it's an honest but curious server, then it's fine, right? It will not do that. But we don't like to believe too much on the honesty but curiosity of uh, any party. So the guy can send an X scene that it found from another query and again gain some cross query leakage. That's one problem. The other problem is that when we want to extend this to the multi client setting, now this, the client is getting too much information because now the client is getting all the scenes that give information about stuff that the client is not supposed to know. When the client is the owner of the data, as we are talking now, then that's not a problem. But to extend it to, to a multi client, to malicious clients, this solution actually doesn't work. And uh, also, we have the issue that the, the, the uh, server is still learning the scenes, so it can have information about intersection of different S terms. So this can be a solution. If all of these problems is not a problem in a given application, then actually it's a very nice solution. Uh, but we still want something better. So the next thing is just to give up and say, OK, so let's compute the function, this hash function, as a two-party secure computation. Uh, another question is how, how uh, efficient we can do this, uh, this computation. And uh, this is what we are going to do. We are going to uh, define the function h of xind xtrap to be the value of xtrap to the power of xind modulo p. Actually, I don't know why it's modulo p. The modulo p should not be there. Uh, because we are talking about any group. So, so basically now the extra values are values in a group. We don't care about which group. In our implementation, this will be an elliptic curve group. Uh, we need a, a group where the DDH uh, holds. So extra is an element in a group. Xin, we will look at it as an exponent. So Xin will be an element in uh, ZP if the group is of order P. And uh, that's the hash, extra up to the power of xind. What's good about this function is that it's easy to uh, run it as a two-party computation. How do you do that? Uh, we, again, we are considering here things about extra up to the xind as something like an oblivious PRF, where xind is the key and the input x is extra up. We want the client to enter extra, the, the server input xint. Uh, and then the server learns uh, uh, extra to the power of xint, but uh, nothing else. So how do we do that? The regular uh, uh, blinding in the exponentiation. So uh, the client that has extra will raise it to a random uh, power z. Uh, we'll we send that to, to, to the server, who will take that value, will raise it to the power of x in, and send it back to, to the client, who will de-blind it by raising it to the power of 1 over z, hence uh, getting the value of f extra x in, which it can send to the server, who uses that for the search. So this is a, 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 a joint computation of this function. Unfortunately, this thing has many problems. So first of all, since E knows xind, then the fact that he learned extra to the xind means that he knows extra. So basically, we did nothing useful with the thing. We were trying to hide extra, and we didn't do that. So that's one big problem. Uh, it, it, uh, the server still learns xin, so it can do all these uh, intersections between S term of, dif of different uh, uh, queries. 
and we also added rounds of interaction. So all the solution gave us very little, except that it gave us the idea for the next step. So the next step is a, a step in which we are going to solve all these problems. Uh, really, the server will not learn Xen, it will not learn extra, there will be non interaction. So, how do we do that? So, the, so he, he, I, I wrote again the, the interactive part, but the non interactive part will do the following. What we are going to do is we are pre computing the blinding of the interactive protocol and storing it in the database. So uh, if you look at, at the deep blinding of, uh, of, of, of the client in the, in, the interactive, um, in the interactive protocol, basically we have that there is this extra to the power of z computed by the client that then is deep blinded by raising it to the power of xin over z. So what we are going to do is we are going to store in the database, together with the W1 list, a, a, a value, uh, instead of xint, we will buy, uh, save, we will store xint over z. Now, during search, uh, the client will take its extra to the power of z. z will be computed under some PRF. Uh, which, you know, it's a deterministic computation. So the, the client uh, takes extra up to the power of z, sends that to the, to, to the server who has uh, x sin over z already in, the, in storage, so it can take that value y, x sin to the z, and raise the extra up to the z to that value to get back extra up to x in. So anyway, the, the details are uh, less important. The point here, I think that is an, the interesting idea here, is that uh, we, uh, you know, like there is de-randomization, so there is a de-interaction <laughs> de uh, de interaction of the interactive protocol so that instead of actually computing a, a fresh blinding in each run of the protocol, you store the, the blinded value and you, you use it, you know, you regenerate the blinding value in some deterministic way, I mean pseudo-random, but deterministic way, and you end uh, computing the, 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 the function, uh, the h function, which in this case is x trap to the x int. Uh, now, by doing that, then first of all, there is no more interaction because now it's the, uh, the, the, the server reads all these W lists with all these, uh, what we call the Y value, xin divided by Z, and what the client does is to send the different, uh, I mean, he sends extra to the power of Z in one, I mean, it's one interaction, uh, a single round, and, uh, and the, the server can compute the function. It doesn't learn xin. It doesn't learn xin because now what he's reading is not xin, he's reading xin divided by z. And z is a, is a pseudo random pad. Uh, so we, we hid uh, xin, and uh, it doesn't learn extra because that was the idea of doing this two party computation. Um, and I'm not sure how much of this I, can, I, I want to show you. Uh, this is just putting this into a, a full protocol. Um, let me just think about this. Okay, so um, yeah, I. I, I, I this is the idea, now you just, to make the idea work, uh, you know, you, you have to do some more work, but that, that's, that's basically the idea. One, one thing to realize here is that uh, before, in BXT, the, the client was sending extra 2 to extra n uh, to the server, and the server did all the work. Now, basically, the client will be sending 
every uh, x trap to to the z, but it will be doing that with a different z per entry in the w1 list. So essentially, it's a long message that the, the I mean, still one message, but it's a long message. And the, the complexity, we are talking now about exponentiation, so we have to be careful about uh, the cost of the thing. So in, the, in terms of number of exponentiations, the pre-processing, uh, the number of exponentiations is as the number of pairs uh, document keywords. OK, so for example, in our biggest uh, um, experiment, these were 100 billion. So uh, that's a lot of uh, exponentiations. Uh, now, the, do, do, doing all kinds of optimizations with uh, same base exponentiation, stuff like that, uh, we get to something like uh, in, in an eight core uh, machine, half a million exponentiations a second, which usually, I mean, we think of exponentiations as being more, more expensive than that. The bottom line is that uh, it takes a few days of uh, cranking exponentiation for that big database, but uh, you, you can do it. And online, during the search, uh, the, the, each, each um, access to the disk, it's uh, IO access is, uh, I mean, you, you can do something between 300 and 500 exponentiations per uh, IO access. So in that sense, basically, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite amazing how, uh, how much the, the, the exponentiations are not in the, uh, in the um, critical path of this computation. Now, if you're going to do this in a small database in which uh, you know, it's a RAM resident database and you don't go to disk, then the bottlenecks become, bottleneck becomes the, become the exponentiations. Especially with the case if you didn't choose W1 very well, right? Which one? W1? If W1 turns out to be right, right. So all of all of the thing, all of the thing is uh, uh, proportional to the the size of W1. And let me say something about that. Yeah. So uh, the, the 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 the. The bottom line with these experiments is that actually uh, these exponentiations are much less uh, expensive than, uh, than we usually think, especially when you do it in, in, in bulk numbers and uh, you know, with the right optimizations, um, particularly because it's very parallelizable. So if you have a multi-core machine, you, you can do that. Um, Definitely something to, to, to take into consideration, you know, not, not to be afraid of, uh, of exponentiations, uh, like something that, you know, we, you know, we cannot do that. Actually, we can do many of them. Um, yes? How do you know how to choose the W1 one? So uh, that's a very good question. Um, so in the case of uh, the single client, where the client is the owner of the data, it has information about the data, and it can, you know, it has statistics. You can, you know, we, it, it, you, you can even uh, store at the server a small uh, database of, of uh, with, with statistics, really to give you a very, very, uh, very specific idea of what is the right W1 to choose. The problem is when we go to the multi-client case where the client is not the owner of the data, then the question is whether the client has information about the, 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 the statistics of the database. If it has the information about the statistics of the database, it can use it. If the statistics of the database are hidden, then uh, the, the, the party that will do the statistics is the owner of the data, but when you do oblivious authorization, then there is some question there of how you do oblivious authorization and at the same time you give 
you choose the data you want. So anyway, the, the big picture is in the case of, sing, of single client, which we most of the time talk about that, uh, client is owner of the data, it knows the statistics, it can choose on that basis. In the other cases, it's more complex, but, uh, and you can get to the point in which the only thing that you, you can do is say, okay, if I have a name and the last name, I always choose the last name as, the, as, as my, my W1. Um, okay, let me talk about leakage because that is uh, the, the tricky part with all the things. So uh, doing all these uh, non-interactive uh, solution, we solve uh, the, 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 all, all the leakage that comes between uh, cross-query cross uh, interactions, um, except for the following annoying uh, leakage that we still have. It's le much less than uh, what we had before. <coughs> But to me, it's still annoying, and it, I, I, uh, that, that's my final solution. I will not show how to get rid of that, because I don't know how. So this is the, this is the, the, the only form of inter-query uh, or cross-query leakage. It's the following thing. If you have, so, so first of all, if you have two queries that are the same, W1 and X1 and W2, W2 and X2, and they are the same query, then that is something that leaks here. But if you have W1 and X and W2, uh, I mean, you have two, two queries. Uh, let me see. With, yeah, if you have two queries with, di with different S terms, W1 is, di is different, then you don't learn if the X term is the same or different in the two queries. So you have W1 and X1, uh, W1 and X1, and W2 and X2, and W1 and W2 are different, then you don't know if the X terms are the same or not. However, if W1, and, and here is the annoying leakage, if W1 and W2 have a document in common, then you learn whether you have a, the same X term. And the reason for that is that this H function will, will give you equality in, in these two cases because you will be computing the, the hash function on the same end. And if it's also in the same uh, X term, then you get leakage. So this is a good example of what happens in these solutions uh, where you get this level of ad hoc, what they call ad, ad hocish. Uh, leakage that uh, is, you know, very hard to quantify uh, and understand how bad it's, it is in a in, in, in practical situation or not. Uh, and uh, but that's the kind of things that I think each 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 practical solution. Ben will be talking later about the solution, the Columbia Bell Lab solution to this problem. So there you'll see there is an, another form of ad hoc, ad hocish uh, leakage. This is the kind of things that uh, we would like to get rid of, but uh, f yeah, and fortunately there are many young people here that uh, will, will will help us improve on the things. Hopefully, even though you know, even with ORAM, which is mu much uh, stronger tool, we still have. Uh, significant leakage. Let me, let me mention one element that uh, leaks here, which is this one. That, that also looks as a very annoying leakage. Uh, the client, well, in this, OK, again, the, um, that's my, uh, let's talk about the server. The server has to visit the list of documents that uh, include W1. Again, it, it sees that in encrypted form. It cannot relate one search with another search, but it, it sees the length of that list. So the, the server learns how, uh, what's this, how many documents satisfy W1. And that doesn't seem like something you want to leak. Um, the question there, is this unavoidable? Yes? Can you throw in 
always based on differential privacy? Just to cut it a little bit? Yeah, if, if I don't mention the word differential privacy before the end of my talk, you need to ask that question because I have to talk about that. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. But so, so, so this, this is a good example of several things. First of all, it's leakage that is not nice. It's not nice. I mean, why would you uh, leak the size of a W1? It's not nice. Uh, is there, can, can we avoid that? Well, we can always uh, pad. We can always, you know, in, uh, you know uh, put more things in this list. You know, there is the W1 list with all kind of things. You can put dumb stuff there. So you can always do that. Uh, but uh, there is something more fundamental here. And this is a question, one of the interesting questions that arise here, which is, which of the things are leakages that are just because we are not smart enough to have a better scheme, or some leakages that are unavoidable? And, and here there is a claim that there is some, uh, something unavoidable about this leakage. And think about the, 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 the following settings. Think about a database where you are searching for Muhammad Lee. Okay? Uh, someone told me uh, that Muhammad is the more common name in the world, and Lee is the most common last name in the world. But how many Muhammad Lees are there? Uh, not, not too many, right? On the other hand, Sir Lee, by the way, L-I, okay? It's better. L-E-E, -E, maybe there is more. Uh, on the other hand, search for my colleague uh, Charanjit Jutla. There are not too many Charanjit Jutla. So may, there may be as many Charanjit Jutlas as Muhammad uh, Lee in, in my database. Uh, would you be able to distinguish between this? Is there a way to run a search that these two queries will be indistinguishable? So the answer is yes. What you do is you pre-process all the pairs, and you have a column with the pre-process things. But if you don't pre-process, I mean, Charanjit Jutla, there are so, many, so few guys, and the other one, so many Muhammad, so many Lees. You know, it doesn't sound like uh, you can really resolve all the Muhammad Lees uh, without, you know, somehow paying the complexity of each one of these, of these keywords. Yeah? Do you, uh, you, you don't look convinced. I mean, how are you going to find all the Muhammad Lees without going through at least all the Muhammad or all the Lees or something like that? So anyway, if you think about it, you'll, you'll convince yourself that uh, there must be a complexity that has to do with the uh, frequency, or at least the, the frequency of the least frequent element in the conjunction. So when we were thinking about this stuff, I was sure that the people in database know this. I mean, they're well-known lower bounds. Well, they're known. Uh, we couldn't find them. But uh, we worked a little bit on that. Now, we are talking about uh, polynomial uh, time problems. So there is no incompleteness here to prove or anything like that. But uh, there is this problem of three sum. Three sum is a problem of you're given a list of numbers, and you have to decide whether there is a, uh, three numbers that two, the sum of two numbers equal a third number in the, in the list. And of course, this, uh, this is a, a, a polynomial time uh, problem, so there is no strong lower bounds. But there are assumed lower bounds that you cannot do that better than quadratic time or something like that. Well, interestingly, this problem that I'm talking about can be reduced. Uh, from, from this threesome, um, basically it gives you, as I said, you can solve this independently of the frequency by just pre-computing. So basically what you have to prove is that, except if you pre-compute or you store enough, all, all kind of trivial solutions, then you cannot do better. Bottom line, uh, it seems that it is unavoidable to have complexity, at least uh, uh, computation time, related to the least frequent term in a conjunction. And therefore, something that looks very annoying actually may be something which is quite of the essence of the thing. 
Um, and the question of uh, lower bounds and trade-offs, privacy, uh, privacy and uh, performance, this is a good example. Uh, and there are many other examples like this in this, um, in this area. <laughs> now let me see. Okay. So there are these annoying things that are leaked, but I want to go over a list of things that are not leaked because, you know, we focus so much on the bad things. Let's uh, give us uh, ourselves some credit and say, okay, here's what we don't uh, leak. So we don't leak plain text data. Uh, all the data is semantically secure. No deterministic encryption, no substitution codes, no order preserving encryption. By the way, I didn't talk about range queries yet. So we, di we didn't need order preserving encryption, but we will do range queries without order preserving encryption. Uh, the queried values, either S terms or X terms, are never showed in playtext forms. The, the server does not learn indexes of documents except for those that he has to return, I mean the result set. Uh, there is no information about intersection between X terms in different, uh, in different um, queries. And the only thing that uh, remains about this cross query thing is this tab that I said that if, w, if, if two S terms have an intersection and you happen to query it with the same uh, uh, X term, then you, you learn that. Uh, and that is also something that uh, you does question about uh, masking or padding comes into, I mean, there are things that can be done. For example, you, uh, you can have multiple uh, um, uh, um, versions of these uh, metadata and query, in this different queries, query different, uh, uh, different versions of the metadata. It's a question is you have enough space. Uh, and again, it's all about, all about trade-offs. Well, the, we can prove a theorem that that leakage that we discover, the described is actually all you, you, you actually leak. Uh, what does it mean for an application? Well, good luck. Uh, it really, uh, at this point, we only can go and, 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 and do this on a, on a per application basis. More about this in the open problems uh, chapter of, the pres of this talk. Uh, the proof is uh, ugly, long, uh, nothing too interesting going on, but uh, I, uh, oh, as I said before, there's no, no, no need for random oracle model in this uh, solution. I mean, I, I don't think that that is very important, but it's just interesting that something that is working hard to be very practical does not require it. When we go to the model with multi-clients, or more precisely, when the peer type uh, setting where we hide from the owner of the data the queries, then we need random oracle. Um, and yeah, these are the, some of the ideas that we use in the, in the proof. I will not go through them. They are only, we, we are actually using as, a, as an assumption uh, these, uh, actually in, in, in this case, just DDH. And of course, PRF and semantic encryption. Um, okay. So let's go to see what other things we can do. So we can do Boolean formulas. We can do Boolean formulas of the form, what's there in the, in, uh, in the frame, W1 and Boolean, uh, any Boolean function on W2 to WT, where this phi can be anything, and any program that works on Boolean inputs where the Boolean inputs of W2 means that you replace the W2 and the bit saying it, it, it uh, belongs or not belongs to, to a document. 
Uh, and basically, it's exactly the same solution as the conjunction solution. Because in the conjunction solution, what we did is to take the W1 and look for all the documents, those that the x terms were there, right? W2, we, we had this hash function answering the question, is W2 in the document? Is W3 in the document? So we can do exactly the same thing here. Uh, you, che you, ch you check for each one of the Ws. I mean, you go, you take W1, you go over the list of all documents that have W1, and for each of them, you ask for W2 to WN if they are there. It, that gives you the Boolean value, yes there or not there. And now you can apply the Boolean function to that. That means that you can do uh, uh, negations. Right? In conjunctions, we just wanted to ask whether the word was there. If you have a negation, then you may ask the question is if the keyword is not there, but uh, basically any Boolean function. And uh, that means that you get the same performance and the same leakage, essentially, uh, for general Boolean functions as you, you had it for, uh, for conjunctions. Okay, now I have to make a very, very hard decision. Um, yeah, let me, let me skip and go. Okay, if, if, if you have questions, it is a good time to ask questions. If you don't have questions, it's also a good time to ask. Yes. What do you mean ahead of time? No, 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 the, what, what you do, what you have to do is you reveal the formula to the server. I mean, you don't reveal the values, but you reveal the formula. And if it's an end, uh, you know, x and y or not uh, z, then the, the, the symbolic formula you, you, you reveal because the, the server will compute for each word it's there or not there and then compute the, the formula on that thing. But uh, yeah, no. It's actually very general. Uh, uh, so this one. Okay. Uh, let me go to this setting. Until now, I mean, uh, everything that we talked in this, uh, conf in this whatever is called this school was all about uh, the data is the client's data. There is a single client which queries the data, OK? Its own data. Now we are going to move to a setting where there are own an owner of the data which will authorize different clients to access the data such that an authorized client can get the results to its authorized queries and nothing else. Nothing else means that if there is something else, that will be called leakage. Did someone want to? No? I thought there was a question there. OK, so. Um, now we, we had until now Charlie, the client, and Eddie was the server. Uh, remember that Eddie was for ED, encrypted data. Now we introduce our friend Debbie, which stands for DB, da database. She is the owner of the database. And uh, what she's doing now, she's taking her data, doing some pre-processing, to it, putting it at Eddie's, which is the cloud. As before, uh, Eddie keeps the encrypted data and will serve uh, um, <coughs> queries coming from, from clients. Now, the clients will come with tokens provided by, uh, by Debbie. 
Uh, and again, they can search through queries that are authorized by Debbie and learn nothing beyond these, uh, the results for these queries. In this model, clients are, uh, are multiple, malicious, malicious, colluding. I mean, they will do anything to, to, to break the, the scheme. So it means that when we prove a theorem claiming security, and the, 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 the claim will be that, uh, that the scheme is secure up to some leakage to the client that we will define. Uh, the next step will be to, so the, the, the first step is that the, the Debbie, the owner of the data, will uh, authorize queries uh, in, in, you know, in the following way, client comes, shows the query. You know, I want to query a first name like this, a last name like this, zip code. And the, Debbie will decide if that client can query, uh, make that query or not. And we learn the query. The next uh, setting is the one in which Debbie will authorize queries, but without learning the values that are being queried. So for example, she can learn that or she, she, she can authorize a client to, to, to search by first name, last name, and zip code, but without having to reveal to Debbie what the actual values the guy is looking for. And by the way, this is uh, this, this uh, NSA or IARPA a funded project, they are very interested in this setting, which is, uh, we, we call this setting, by the way, OSPEER, always outsource symmetric peer, a peer because it has this feeling of not revealing uh, the query. I mean, in all the searchable encryption, you have the thing that you don't reveal the query to the server where the encrypted data uh, is stored, but here you don't re uh, reveal the query to the owner of the data either. Um, okay, so the first setting, the one in which Debbie learns the, the query, we call it MC, multi-client SSC. Uh, and let's see what changes we have to do to the, to, to the protocol to, to, to support it. So, well, I, I didn't really show all the details of OXT that maybe I, I would uh, need to actually show the, the mechanism that we have to, to add here. But um, the, 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 the problem, uh, so if, if you think about BXT, in BXT, the client sent to the server just the S tag and XTRAP2 to XTRAP N. If that was the whole protocol, then it would be very easy to do a, a, a multi-client uh, solution because what would happen is that uh, Debbie will give S tag and XTRAP2 to XTRAP N to, to, um, to the client and he will go with that to the Eddy, and, and that's simple. The problem is that in the, in the actual OXT, to solve all the problems we have with cross-query leakage, the, the client is not sending just extra to, to the X, um, to extra and it's, it's, should, it's sending a sequence of extra to the Z, where this thing runs, is, is, a, is a long sequence of the length of uh, dbw1. So the DB cannot give the client all the tokens that the, the client will need. Uh, first of all, there are many, and second of all, DB doesn't know how many he will need. So, um, so what, uh, 
Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much I can really explain this without the details of OXT, but let me try. So first of all, le let's think about BXT. In BXT, the, the client re would receive strap 1, xstrap 2 to xstrap n, and send it to Eddie. But even in that case, the the, that would be bad. Because what, what the client could do, it will get x trap, you know, s tag and x trap for one query, and s trap and x trap for another query, and now the client will be able to mix and match. Uh, to take the s tag from one query with the x tag from the other query. So this cross query um, leakage would actually apply to, to, to the client. So essentially, that, that's easy to solve. We can ask Debbie to sign the S trap and the X traps so that Eddie checks that and, uh, and, and it will not serve a query that has not been signed by, uh, by Debbie. Problem is that uh, in the actual OXT, there is not just a one set of, the, um, of S trap, X traps, but it's a set like that that is raised to the power of z, so it's a long sequence of these things. So the question is, you know, if you look at what actually the, uh, the client needs to send, uh, he needs to send s something like this, s trap 1 and x trap 2 to the z up to x trap n to the z, and this for many z's. So, the question is, how can you, how can Debbie sign these values for many different z's? So one way is that Debbie uh, learns all the z's. She takes each one of these uh, n elements and signs them. But can we sign, is it possible to give a signature on, uh, on the value extra, extra two to extra n such that the client can now generate a signatures for x trap 2 to the z to x trap to uh, n to the z. So the question is, is it possible to give a signature on one set of x traps that, that the client can then raise to the power of z and show a, a signature on it? Uh, uh, let's say just one element. I, I want to give you an ex, a signature on x trap, but then, then you can show a signature on any value x trap to the z that you want. Uh, so the, the answer should be no, because if you give me a value, a signature on x trap, and I can generate a signature on x trap to the z, then this will not be a secure signature, right? It would be a, 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 forge, a, a forgery. But we are going to solve it with something that we can call uh, homomorphic signatures, which basically uh, is, uh, works as, 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 as follows. What uh, Debbie is going to do, she's going to give a, a signature on S, x trap to the to some random power r uh, x trap two to the power r two x trap n to the power r n, okay? She will give that to the client, uh, and then she will took, take r two to the uh, r two and uh, up to r n and put that as an encryption sent to Eddie. So she's blinding these values with a secret random uh, value that the, the client does not know. Uh, what the client will send now the powers of these things, the power z, that will include these r's that it cannot uh, get rid of the client because it doesn't have it, but the, but the server can learn these r's directly from, from Debbie and can de-blind these signatures. 
So I think it's, um, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think I'm, uh, I'm making myself too understandable here. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I, I recommend you read this from the paper. I think it will be more uh, understandable than what I can now explain. But let, let me, so the, the, the client has to send something like this, extra Z1, extra Z2, many elements like this. Um, and th th this need to be signed. And the reason they need to be signed is because otherwise, uh, I mean, th these, are, these are elements that the client gets from, from, from Debbie. And if they are not signed, then in, in another query where this guy gets some extra prime, if, if, these, if these are not signed, okay, extra to n, extra two to extra and prime. If they are not signed, then what uh, the client can do is take this extra from here, replace with here, and basically query a conjunction or a, a, a formula that he was not allowed. So these have to be signed. But the problem is that this is a long list of things to be signed, something that uh, Debbie doesn't even know a priori because how many of them depends on the size of uh, W1, which uh, at the time when the client goes to Debbie is not known. So what Debbie will do, she will give extra one to the R1, extra n to the Rn, okay? She will give that to the client. And she will send R1 to Rn to Eddie. I mean, she gives that to the client in some uh, encrypted envelope. And now uh, the client will run the same protocol as before, but with this R1. So instead of sending extra to the Z, it will send extra one R1 to the Z, uh, and this will go to Eddie, and what will Eddie will do is take all this stuff and raise it to the power of one over R1. Uh, so it's getting rid of the R1 that uh, uh, Debbie put there, but what you can prove is that uh, any I mean, the, any, any, any sequence of extra apps that the client will send either will have the original RIs or will just give uh, some, uh, some result in the hash function that will correspond to, to know, you know, uh, it, it, you know, all of these ex all of this stuff we did in order to search things in the exit, if the client tries to cheat, it will give results that will never be in the exit except for negligible probability. So um, that's the, the idea uh, of how to actually uh, sign a, a, a sequence of elements that you, you don't know a priori. Um, no? Yes. Like yes, give me one second so I know what. Uh... Okay. 
Yeah, so let's uh, let's do the the break. Uh, ben, 